Morning, Fleetwood Bible Church. Morning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, last week, uh, Jeff Getz had us in Luke chapter 10, and I wanted to revisit uh, verses 16 through 20 for a moment. So Jesus uh, says this, Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me, but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. And the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Church, if we call upon the name of Jesus and are saved by him, our names are written in the book of life, and we get to spend an eternity with him. And that testimony is what we should be talking about to everybody we encounter, to everyone who will listen. Some will listen, some won't. But no matter the audience, what Jesus did is worth talking about and singing about. So let's stand and let's declare our testimony this morning.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Nygaard. I'm one of the uh, elders here. It's a, a privilege to, uh, to serve the body on this elder board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to church this morning in the house of our Lord as we worship him and grow in love and grace together. Um, just before we get into the slides, something uh, real quick. If, if perchance, when you walked into the doors and you saw the Christmas tree and you saw the Christmas boxes, uh, the Operation Christmas Child boxes, and you brought one along and you deposited there, um, at the end of the announcements, we're going to just go ahead and, and bring them to the front. So feel free to, um, if, you, if you left your box at the tree, please go ahead and get that so that you can participate in presenting the boxes uh, to the altar. Um, also, before we get into the slides, a quick, huge uh, thank you, Free Bay. Yesterday was a huge success. We had a raft of volunteers. We had a raft of volunteers. We had a huge amount of, of, of uh, stuff we were able to give away, and, and uh, we just we blessed the socks off of countless, countless folks. Yes. 400, thank you, 437 people. And we had so many folks be the hands and feet of Jesus for those, for those people, and, and I'm just so thankful, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, and so if you volunteered in any way, thank you. Just thank you on behalf of the elders and the, and the pastors, thank you. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, oh, if you're a visitor, uh, we certainly would love to, to get to know you a bit. Um, in, the, in the lobby, you'll see along the back wall by the, by the right-hand doors there, there are some gift baskets. Please help yourself to a gift basket. See Pastor Drew at the, at the, uh, the welcome desk there. We'd love to, to get to know you. Um, all right, now, now for the slides. We've got lots of them, a lot of announcements. So here we go, Operation Christmas Child Packing Party. Um, there's a packing party coming. Parents, it's a wonderful opportunity for an activity for you and your children to send a gift of love to a child around the world. Margie Doherty has prepared all the contents for the boxes and is ready for little hands and big hearts to help her stuff them. There's no cost for this activity, but we do need you to please sign up so we know how many to expect. If you're in our database, you, you should have gotten an invitation already, but so far only three families have signed up. So please make sure that you sign up so we know we can expect you, we can uh, be prepared for you. Uh, today, after this service, there's gonna be a Q&A for our elder candidate and that person is the only person playing music right now. Scott Cantner right here. So uh, uh, so if, uh, if you would please stick around for that, for that very important Q&A time. It will be Zoomed, um, and so folks who are Zooming in, stick around, please. Um, the, uh, the link was shared in the weekly update by email. It's also posted to the, it will be posted to the app by noon today. Uh, so if you're on Zoom, please post your questions in the chat area. Um, we're not equipped to allow audible comments from the Zoom participants. So if you just please identify yourself and then we'll be able to read your question. Along those same lines, Congregational Business Meeting two weeks from today. Uh, it'll be November 28th, same time around noon, immediately after this service. Um, and just a couple of things. Please note, you need to be in attendance to vote. There will not be voting online by absentee or proxy ballot. Uh, so you want to plan accordingly for that. The meeting will follow the second service, as I said. Uh, and we're going to be looking at um, the budget specifically, um, which will be shared, uh, I'm sorry, has been shared on the weekly update. And uh, if you can take a look at the budget in preparation for the meeting, that would be super helpful as well. Sunday school electives, we're going to change things around uh, for the winter quarter. And so uh, that will begin on December 5th. And there are several options uh, for us to choose from. And we'll need to order books and create class rosters. Uh, there is a bulletin board in the south uh, hallway with information on the website and app as well just to kind of help us all get uh, up to speed on what's going on with these new Sunday School classes. So please take a look and register soon so that we can be prepared for your presence. Also, Thanksgiving offerings coming up. Uh, so this Thanksgiving, we just ask that you would please consider a special benevolence offering. Offering envelopes are on the stone ledge in the lobby. You can also select this designation online if you would like to give digitally. Also, 
volunteer appreciation dinner. So calling all volunteers if you are currently acting, uh, I'm sorry, currently serving in any ministry, in any capacity, we want to honor you. We want to honor you with what my kids like to they lovingly refer to as Jesus chicken. It's Chick-fil-A. Yeah, we want to we want to give you Chick-fil-A and Sweet Street. Uh, and so um, you can certainly sign up for that on the app and uh, check that out on the weekly update as well. Also, I told you it was a lot of announcements. We've got a raft of them here. Uh, Wednesday night kids program, Wow Kids, coming in January. It's set to begin January 5th. We need you to get excited with us. Um, parents, please register your children so we can prepare for this launch. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, get them involved as well, and register through the app and weekly update. Finally, Operation Christmas Child. The National Collection Week begins today. Uh, and so this is the day we've been planning, we've been shopping for. Uh, at this time, what we're going to be doing is we'd like to invite you to come forward and present your gifts here on the steps. Um, take a minute, pray for everyone who will touch these boxes, and especially the child and the family who will receive them. There will be a time of corporate prayer as well after we have all presented our gifts. Um, those who've built boxes online, those who boxes have already been delivered, we can take some time now to just pray where you are. And so at this time, if you have a box to present, please stand, please come forward anywhere along where it's convenient, please present your boxes, and then there'll be a period of corporate prayer after that. sovereign Lord oh what a privilege it is to join you with this endeavor what a privilege it is to give back what you first given us through a vehicle that takes your word your truth your gospel message to all corners of this earth what a privilege Lord on this day we pray that the seeds of your gospel would fall on fertile ground. Pray, Lord, that they would not be scattered in such a way that they'd fall on dry ground or birds would take them, Lord. I, 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 I pray that this would be the start of an incredible, bountiful harvest where we would reap, you would reap so much harvest. 30, 60, 100 times as it says in your scriptures. We thank you, Lord. We pray for each, each child's hands that open up these boxes, that they would be excited, yes, for the gifts, but also their hearts and minds would be open to hear your word and your truth, to learn about you, about who this Jesus is, and Lord, that it would, um, that it would grow in their, in their villages and with their families, their parents, their family members. We just pray, Lord, for your supernatural, superintending of what we have here. Lord, we pray for those who are not able to join us today. Due to illness, we have many in the hospital. Lord, I please, I pray you would give wisdom to their doctors and nurses. I pray you would give those folks supernatural comfort, that peace that passes all understanding. 
confidence in you as they walk through this challenging time in their lives. Finally, Lord, during this time, this time of worship, this time of learning, this time of, of, uh, of soaking in what you would have Pastor Drew speak, Lord, I pray that we would not crave what our itching ears would want to hear, but Lord, we would crave the truth that you have said on Pastor Drew's lips. That what he preaches, it's exactly what you would have us hear. So we would be molded, we'd be shaped in a way that is truly pleasing in your sight. May our worship this morning be true, that brings glory to you and to you alone. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' precious, matchless name, we pray. Church, our God is the God of the impossible. He is a God of victory. And though we might be able to fathom what goes into this whole shoebox thing, the kids who are receiving these boxes are likely seeing a completely different picture. They are seeing love and hope on a scale that maybe they could only have previously viewed as impossible. Our God moves mountains, and sometimes we get to be a part of those mountain-moving experiences. I think through these shoeboxes, we're doing just that. We're making a difference in someone's life such that they just might come to know Christ through it. That's huge. And this whole initiative is a modern day miracle that we get to be a part of year in and year out. Let's make sure we don't take that for granted. God moves mountains in ways that we may or may not expect, sometimes in ways that seem simple to us, sometimes in ways that we can't comprehend. Nevertheless, he moves them, and he fights for us every day. He is worthy of our praise, and we have ultimate victory in his name. Some days might be harder than others, but he is constantly working for our good, and our response should be that of worship, that of declaration of love for him. Let's keep singing to him this morning.
Worship team, you guys be careful getting down off this stage. There's a lot of boxes here. It's awesome. Trip hazards, we've got so many. So, what a great day to see this procession of boxes coming up here. And all of these are going to end up someplace where they are going to share the gospel with children that really need to hear it and really need to be encouraged this Christmas season. And, uh, you know, I think many of us need to be encouraged this Christmas season. It's been a rough go these last couple of years. And so I'm excited to get back into uh, the book of John here today for uh, the second to last time, at least this go around. Uh, Next week, we'll be finishing up John 6, and we're going to push pause on the book of John for a moment. We're going to get into our uh, our, our Advent series, which is going to be led by Christian Lefko, our pastoral intern. He's going to teach the whole series. It's going to be amazing. And, uh, and then in January, I will be back with you, but we're going to get into the book of Genesis again. We're going to pick up where we left off uh, at the end of earlier this year. We're going to start the story of Abraham and go through that, and then uh, we'll resume John again, uh, kind of more towards the summer. So just so you know where we're going. But I want to ask you this morning, has God ever provided for you in a direct and amazing way? Have you seen him do something like that in your life? Uh, I know that many times we see God work sort of indirectly through the people of God, and somebody says just what we needed to hear in that moment, or somebody provides a need that we didn't even know uh, that they were going to do, and it's just amazing. Um, But sometimes we even see God directly sort of intervene and and do something in our life, and it's always amazing when that happens. Um, That's happened, you know, several times in my life, but one that I kind of remember this morning is um, the miracle of the broccoli. Let me explain. So we were living in New Jersey uh, at this time. This was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, financially, things were a little tight uh, at that moment. And so Julie would would plant a garden every year to try to save on fresh vegetables and stuff like this. Um, We did that for many years. But, you know, most of the time, the garden would would grow and produce stuff. And by September, October at the latest, it would all start to sort of die out as the weather got cold, you know? And so our broccoli plants usually, you know, sort of, gave their last (laughs) yield of the season in October or so. But this one year, when things were especially lean, it seemed like we just needed, you know, a little wink from heaven. Uh, We had these incredible broccoli plants that would not die, and they just kept producing against all odds. Now, this was the year that we had the October blizzard. Do you guys remember this? There was like a foot of snow that came down before Halloween, and tree branches were breaking and everything else. Well, we got a foot of snow dumped on top of our broccoli plants, and somehow when all this snow melted, the broccoli kept going. I mean, it kept on producing like more. It kept producing new stuff. We picked fresh broccoli all the way till Christmas that year. It was insane. And I don't know, maybe that's normal for broccoli to do this. I have no idea, but it never did that for us before. And so Julie and I kind of took that as, you know, God's little wink from heaven. It was our manna from, from heaven that year that God just sort of provided for us in a moment where every bit of money saved was really helpful. Well, last week, and, and by last week, I mean two weeks ago, because Jeff was here last week speaking, but last time that we were in the book of John, we saw a story about these tired and hungry people, this crowd of people that ran halfway around the Sea of Galilee to be with Jesus, and they got to see something pretty miraculous themselves, didn't they? God directly met their need. He met their hunger as Jesus multiplied five loaves of bread, and he fed them all, and it was pretty incredible. But it made them start to think about their ancestors and how Moses provided manna from heaven for them. And they started to think, you know, this thing that Jesus did is kind of like that. You know, he kind of miraculously provided bread for us. And so they started to wonder, could this be the Messiah? We think it might. Maybe it could be. And so they came up with a great idea. Let's force him to be our king, right? And this is why Jesus got out of there and he sent the disciples on the boat and he, he went and prayed by himself. He got away from the people because, of course, we see that they're completely missing the point. They're missing the greater reality behind this miracle that Jesus really wants them to see. And so today, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to circle back around to that miracle of the, the feeding of the 5,000. He's going to explain what this multiplication of bread was really all about. And he's going to break it down for them so that they can understand and so that hopefully they can receive him 
as Lord and Savior. So turn in your Bibles this morning, John chapter 6, and we're going to begin with verses 22 through 34 and see how these people are searching for a miracle. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. So let's sort of set the stage here. Let's look at the the setting here of this story. Remember that last time uh, Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat and, and go across from Bethsaida to Capernaum on their own, right? And he went away to pray. And as the disciples traveled, uh, they encountered a storm. You remember this? And we asked the question, why did Jesus send them if he knew that there was going to be a storm? And we concluded that it was so that their faith would grow because Jesus then walked on the water and they saw him and they heard his voice and they trusted him. They invited him into the boat and he calmed the storm and led them safely to shore. And so that all has happened during the night, but now it's the next morning. And the crowd apparently has spent the night, right? Jesus fed them so much food that they just went into a food coma and and slept it off overnight. And now they wake up and they're like, "Uh, we want breakfast, where's Jesus? And so they look for him and they can't find him. We, We don't know where he went. Do you guys know? No, nobody knows, right? We know that the disciples got on the only boat and they left by themselves. He wasn't on the boat, we know that much. But where did he go? Well, we're not sure. And so they must be thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should follow his disciples because where the disciples go, surely Jesus will end up eventually. And so uh, they find these boats that have just gotten there, just freshly disembarked from Tiberias. And so they get on. Uh, They're thinking Jesus might have walked around to meet his disciples, or maybe he's running like they had done. Uh, But they're like, we're not, we're not going to chase him on foot. We already did the whole couch to 5k thing. Uh, We want to take the boats that have just landed here. So they get on these boats, and they think to themselves, we ought to probably beat Jesus across, right? We should probably catch up to the disciples before him, because clearly he didn't go by boat, and that's what we're about to do. Now, one little detail that is not mentioned here is, um, were there enough boats that landed from Tiberias to transport 5,000 or more people across to Capernaum? Probably not. (laughs) Probably not. It's probably a smaller group uh, of the crowd that goes across by boat. The rest may follow by foot, or, you know, we're not really told the specific details there. Uh, But what we are told is that when they arrive, much to their surprise, they find Jesus already there. And, and so they ask, they ask him this question, when did you get here, right? And really what they want to know is, how did you get here? We know you didn't come by boat, so how did you beat us? How, how is that possible? Did you fly? I mean, do you have a transporter that we don't know about? How did you get here before us, Jesus? You know, maybe, maybe you ran, but we've made that trip already. We know how long that takes. There's no way that you could have beat us here. That's kind of what's on their mind. And so, Jesus, in in my mind at least, is probably thinking to himself, well, you're partly right. I did walk here, but I took the direct route. (laughs) I came came right across the lake, you know, and uh, I I would tell you, but you wouldn't believe me if I told you how I got here, right? And so it's really interesting, uh, this whole thing, but notice that they call him rabbi, which means teacher. It's a respectful term, but they're not really sure what to call him because they're still trying to figure out who he is. 
is he the Messiah? We're not sure. You know, we, we think he's at least, you know, a, a pretty good teacher because he says some good things and he's doing these miracles. And so they're trying to figure this out. They call him teacher, which is ironic because they're about to dispute his teaching. <laughs> so they call him teacher, but then they argue with what he teaches. They want him to be their king. We saw that already in verse 15, but they have no idea what kind of a king he has come to be. And so really what we see in these people is that they want their Messiah but they want him on their own terms, right? This is the kind of Messiah that we want you to be. We want you to be a king. We want you to drive out the Romans. We want you to make everything right in our lives. And by the way, if you could keep feeding us, that would be great, right? That's the kind of Messiah that they want. And doesn't the world do this today? God, we will follow you as long as you're the kind of God that we want. As long as you don't push back against anything that I think or anything that I say, you know, as long as you act the way that I think God should act, then I'll follow you. But do you see the danger in this? We reserve the right to tell God who he can and can't be, but if we're dictating to God what he can and can't do, who's really God? I mean, we're the ones pulling the strings, right? We're the ones telling him who he can be. Really, we become God in that scenario. And so what we see here is for these people in the crowd, and also for us as 21st century Christians today, we can either worship a God of our own making, in which case he's not really God at all, or we can come to God on his terms. There's no other choice that's presented. We can come to him on his terms, or we can take his place and be God ourselves, which is kind of a scary place to be. So in verse 26, we see that not surprisingly, perhaps Jesus does not answer their question. He doesn't answer the when did you get here, and he doesn't even answer the how did you get here that they really kind of want to know, but instead he, he answers a question that they didn't ask, he answers the question, why did you follow me over here at all, right? Why, why did you people seek me out in the first place? That's the question that Jesus wants to answer. And so he says, it's not because you want to follow my teaching, but it's because of the free food. That's why you followed me over here. It's because you were hungry. And so they, they have not seen the sign in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. All they have seen was the miracle itself. They're not motivated by full hearts that have received Christ. They're motivated by full bellies, right? And they want to be full again. That's sort of the idea. And so this is where they're coming from, and Jesus realizes this. He recognizes this, but I want you to see that Jesus still loves these people. His heart is still that they would receive him that they would understand, that they would see the sign, and that they would live eternally. That's his heart for them. And so what Jesus does next is he points them to a better food. He says, stop chasing after food that spoils. And he starts to talk about an eternal food that will satisfy them forever, not just for a night, right? And so this is where Jesus goes. He says, there is an eternal food that can only be given by the Son of Man, and that is Jesus himself. And if you start to think about this, what we see here in this conversation between Jesus and the crowd, it's actually the same conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well, right? It's actually the same, the same exact thing. She was thirsty. She didn't know what it was ultimately that she was thirsty for. All she knew is that she was laboring hard to come back here day after day after day to draw water, and it wasn't satisfying. In the same way, these people are hungry and, and they keep on eating their food, but it's not enough. It doesn't satisfy them. They're looking for something more, but they don't know what it is. But Jesus offers this woman living water that will become in her a spring of life that, that wells up into eternal life, and she receives this thing, right? By faith. It's a free gift. And it's the same exact conversation that Jesus is having here with the crowd, just substitute, you know, the, the setting. Instead of being at a well, they are in the, the synagogue in Capernaum, which we discover in verse 59. So they're here in a synagogue, and instead of water, uh, Jesus is offering living bread, right? <laughs> right? So you just swap out the scene and, and swap out water for bread, and we're there. Like, it's the same conversation that is happening here. But look at the response of the crowd here in verse 28. They ask Jesus, what must we do? Right? We want this bread, but what works do we need to do in order for God to give it to us? Right? They're, they're still thinking about a works-based faith. They want to know, uh, how can we earn this? What do we need to do in order for God to, to give it to us? But Jesus sets them straight. He says, no, 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 it's not works, plural. 
He says the work, singular, of God that you must do is believe in the one God sent. There's only one thing that you need to do in order to receive this bread of life, and that is to believe in the one God has sent. It is by faith in Jesus Christ that we receive this bread of life, and that is still true, by the way. There is no other way to the Father. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. We can't just say, God, you know, I have trouble with faith, you know, but, but tell me like five things that I can do to earn my way in. It doesn't work like that. And so this is still true today. But look at verse 30. The crowd sort of says to Jesus, all right, I, we hear you. That's fine what you're saying, but how do we know that you are the one that God sent? In other words, how do we know we can trust you? How do we know that you're the one that we need to put our faith in? What sign can you give us? What will you do? Do you see this? At this point, for those of us who have been paying attention, we kind of want to do the face palm here, right? It's like, how short is your memory? Yesterday, Jesus multiplied five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 people. Like, you were there. You ate the food. How have you forgotten so soon? Right? But that's not exactly what's going on here. The people are saying, no, we remember yesterday, Jesus, but, but seriously, you know, our ancestors ate manna from heaven. Why did they bring that up? How long did the manna keep coming from heaven? Forty years in the desert. Our ancestors ate for 40 years. And so they're saying to Jesus, like, what you did yesterday was cool. It was really good. We appreciated it. But let's be honest, you fed us for one day. Our ancestors ate manna in the desert for 40 years, right? The question that they want to ask Jesus is, how long can you keep the buffet open, right? Can you beat 40 years, right? I mean, honestly, if you're the Messiah and Moses was able to do 40 years, you're supposed to be greater than Moses. How long can you feed us? That's where their minds are. See, the Jews actually had an expectation that when the Messiah came, he would renew the miracle of the manna. This was something that they expected to see. And Jesus actually did as he fed the 5,000. But what they want to know is, are you really the Messiah? Can you keep bringing this bread from heaven? And can you do it for years? And Jesus says to them here that this bread, which has come down from heaven, gives life to the world. And so they hear this and they're like, yes, Jesus, that's the stuff. How do we get it? Right? What do we need to do? for you to to keep giving this to us. It's like the woman at the well who didn't fully understand what Jesus was talking about when he said about the living water, right? And she's almost kind of like, I don't know if you can really give it to me, but sir, give me this water, you know, so that I don't have to keep coming back here day after day in the heat of the sun and drawing water for myself. Look, if you can give me water, it's going to last me forever. Good, I'll take it. And that's where these people are. The crowd says to Jesus, always give us this bread. Moses fed us for 40 years, and that was really cool, but how long can you go, Jesus? How about always? Could you do that? See, they're still thinking about physical bread, aren't they? You eat it, but then you get hungry again. That's why they need it always, is because they're going to keep getting hungry, and so they're going to need Jesus to keep providing bread, but Jesus is about to open their eyes to a whole different reality here. He's pointing them to a greater story, not a a physical need, but a spiritual need. And Jesus says to the crowd, oh, I can can give you this bread always, but it's not what you think. It's not something that you're going to need to eat over and over and over again. If you just eat from it once, you will be satisfied for always. Whoa. (laughs) So let's continue here and, and track with Jesus. Let's look at what he says in verses 35 through 48. We see here the first I am statement, the first of seven that we find in the book of John, but this is powerful. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Sounds pretty awesome, right? But look what happens next. At this, 
the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. So Jesus kind of bookends this, uh, this conversation that he's having with the crowd uh, with this statement that I am the bread of life. Now how many of you know that to a first century Jewish audience that is a loaded statement, right? I mean, especially a first century Jewish audience that is already thinking about Moses and their ancestors who ate the manna in the wilderness, right? They're already thinking about Moses, and now Jesus draws their attention back to the time of Moses, and he reminds them of when Moses was called by God to rescue Israel from Egypt, that before Moses went, he said to God, God, when they ask me who sent me, what should I tell them? What name should I give to you, right? Like, what what can I tell them that they're going to believe? And God said, tell them that I am sent you. That's what you can call me. I am. And now Jesus turns to this crowd who's already thinking about the time of Moses, and he says, I am the bread of life. Understand, this is nothing less than a God claim. And that is how the crowd receives it, right? They're, They're not left ambiguous. It didn't fly over their heads. Like, they totally understood that what Jesus was saying is that I am God, right? They were wondering who he is. What should we call you? Should we call you teacher, right? We're not sure what to call you. What Jesus is saying here is, I'm not leaving open the option for you to just call me a good person or for you to call me a good teacher or a prophet or something like that. I am nothing less than the Son of God. Take it or leave it, right? That's what is happening here. That's a powerful statement. And then Jesus describes to them that the bread of life is not just something that he will give to them. Rather, the bread of life is who he is. He says, I am the bread of life. This is not something that, you know, you're just going to keep finding out on the ground. No, you have to come to me to receive the bread of life. This is an important thing here. It's not a physical bread that they're going to consume over and over and over again for 40 years or more. Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never hunger again. It's a once and done kind of a thing that satisfies our spiritual hunger. That thing that we try to satisfy with so many other things in life, that we try to fill that void with, you know, whatever, whatever the thing may be, job promotions or, or people or, or whatever it may be. Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And by the way, I want you to file away verse 35 until we get to the end, because it's going to come back around. I think it is a clue for us as to how we're supposed to understand something a little bit later when Jesus says that you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's a weird statement, but I think it comes back here to verse 35. We come to him. We believe. This is how we consume Jesus and receive eternal life. It's through faith, right? And so what I want you to see here is when Jesus says, all who come to me will never hunger again, when he says come to me, the idea here is it's a step away from who we used to be, right? In order for us to come to Jesus, we have to step away from our old life. We have to step away from who we once were, you know, that old life of hunger where, you know, we were never satisfied and we tried all these different things and nothing worked, right? Spiritually, we still felt that void. We still felt that emptiness. And Jesus says, come to me. Step away from the old hunger. When you come to me and believe, something will happen spiritually that will satisfy that hunger once and for all because you will have life. You'll have eternal life and you will never hunger again. And so this is really the idea here is that verse 35 is an appeal from Jesus. Like I said, even though these people don't get it, even though they're, they're working on a completely different level, uh, Jesus loves them and he wants them to come to him. He wants them to be saved. And so he makes this appeal, right? He says, I am the bread of life. I'm the only thing in this world that can satisfy you. So will you come to me? Will you believe? 
But even so, uh, verse 36 shows us that the, the people are struggling to believe. And verse 37 shows us that Jesus, you know, is not really basing his hope or his confidence in the people's positive response. He's not looking at this and saying, man, I was so persuasive just then that these people are totally going to get it and they're just going to, you know, flock to me. That's not where Jesus' confidence lies. The truth is that even as they stand in the presence of the one who can give them life, they don't believe. But instead, we see that Christ's confidence is in his Father. Look at verse 37. God will bring about his redemptive purposes. That is what Jesus is confident in. Not that people are going to figure it out or that they're going to get it, but that if God's purpose is to redeem lost people, then God will bring to him all those who are supposed to come. And every single one who is supposed to come will come. And Jesus will keep them and guard them until the last day when he will raise them to eternal life. That's the promise of God. And isn't that an amazing promise? I mean, our only response to that can be, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? I mean, this is, this is the good news of the gospel, and this is God's will. Verse 40, Jesus says that everyone who looks to the Son and believes will have eternal life. And so this is the promise, but it's also the invitation, right? Jesus is saying, this is open for all. Any of you can come to me. Any of you can choose to believe. Any of you can walk away from the old life and, and take a step in my direction. This is for you. And so he's making an invitation. Will you come? Will you believe? But in verse 41, we see that the answer, at least for most of the crowd, is nope. They won't believe. And what they do instead is, is pretty amazing. This is where the story takes a sharp turn away from the woman at the well story. If you remember, uh, when Jesus made the invitation to her, she received it by faith. And not only did she receive eternal life, not only did she drink the living water, but she went back to her entire village and she said, come and see a man who told me everything that I've ever done in my life. Could this be the Messiah? And she brought them all out and they sat and they listened and they begged him to stay for a couple more days. And at the end of it, you remember what they said? They said, we no longer believe just because of this woman's testimony, but we have seen for ourselves that this is the savior of the world, right? Right? And so they receive him with joy. There's this amazing picture of the Samaritans who are not God's people. In fact, they're the enemies of God's people. But when Jesus goes to them, they receive him with joy. And the enemies of God's people are receiving eternal life and becoming part of God's eternal kingdom. But here we see something a little different. We see God's own people standing in a synagogue, no less, right? I mean, they're there to, to worship God, but they refuse to receive the bread of life. They, res they refuse the one who can give them eternal life. And instead, catch this, they begin to grumble. And I put that word on the screen really big because I think it's a really important word. I mean, do you remember where we've seen that word before? Right back with that same story that they keep pointing back to with the manna in the wilderness and Moses, you know, leading the people and God provides them with manna. But what happens next? They begin to grumble. Well, this is nice that we're getting bread, but there's no meat, right? We need meat. What are you going to do about that, Moses? Well, this is nice that, you know, you brought us all the way out here to die, Moses, but there's no water, you know, it would have been better if we just stayed in Egypt as slaves. They begin to grumble against God. And that is a serious, serious offense when you recognize what happens as a result. But now here are these descendants of these same people, and they stand in the presence of the bread of life, and they begin to grumble about his teaching. And may it never be said of us that we have grumbling hearts that refuse to trust Christ, that refuse to follow him where he is leading. Why do I say that with such intensity? Why is it so important that we not grumble against God? Because it shows a lack of faith. When we grumble, we don't have room for faith and grumbling, right? That's kind of the idea. And, and when you recognize what the penalty was for the grumbling, do you remember what happened to those people in the wilderness when they grumbled? No water, no meat. What happened? They died in the wilderness, and they did not see or enter the promised land. 
And when we understand what the promised land represents, that it points to a greater reality, which is the eternal promised land, which is God's kingdom. We call it heaven, right? We don't want to die outside of that. (laughs) We don't want to be those that are left out of the promised land. We want to be there. And so we, we have to come to Jesus by faith, not grumble about all the things that we don't like about his teaching and about the way that God works in this world or whatever it is that we grumble about. And so here, here we see that, that what's happening, what John is showing us um, is, is how loaded this word grumbled really is. What John is trying to prove to us is that these people are missing the one truth that can save them. The one thing that can give them eternal life stands before them, the bread of life, but they're missing it. They're not seeing the sign. They're only operating at the level of the miracle and the physical. Now, verse 42 shows us the source of their grumbling. Why why do they have such trouble with what Jesus is saying? It's because they know his parents. That's actually what their problem is, right? How can he say that he came from heaven? Come on, man, you came from Nazareth and we know it. We were there when your family moved into town. We helped you with the boxes, remember? We know your parents. We we know where you came from. How can you say that you came from heaven? You you think we were born yesterday? Right, that's where their problem is. This is the stumbling block that they have. And this is why Jesus said a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Can you see it? They're struggling with this. Verses 43 to 48 present the same idea as verse 37, but it's stated just a little bit differently. There, we were told that all that the Father gives to the Son will come to him. But here we see the reverse. He says, none can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. And so there's something about our faith that is not entirely initiated by ourselves. It's something that God initiates, and we respond to it. And somehow there's this give and take uh, that is going on here all at the same time. But we know that everyone who receives Christ by faith, he will keep until the end. Now, Jesus says that the way that the Father draws them is not by compulsion. He doesn't grab their arm and twist it behind their back and and drag them kicking and screaming. That's not how he operates. Instead, he teaches them. He shows them a better way. He compels their hearts until they say, you know what, I see it. I see the sign. It's, It's more than a miracle. There's something that's happening here, and God is changing my heart. He's changing my mind, right? He shows them a better way. And Jesus says, only Jesus can show them God because only Jesus has come from the Father. Only Jesus has come from heaven. Only he is the very word of God. And so his teaching is the teaching of God. And so really what this all comes back to is we need to believe in Jesus and we need to come to him. It all comes back to the same thing. This is how eternal life is received. So let's look at the last passage here, verses 49 to 59. This is how we eat the bread, right? And this is where it gets weird. This is where it gets a little gross, you know, on on a physical level if we only understand it in the flesh. But look at what it says here. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, and this is why we say that, um, that, that some people probably did receive Christ, some probably did understand the sign and receive him, because it's hard to argue if you all have the same opinion, right? And so if most of them are arguing against what Jesus is saying, then surely there must be some who are arguing for what Jesus is saying. Uh, but, but track with this here. They begin to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? It is a weird statement. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Well, what are we going to do with that? I mean, it's kind of strange what Jesus is saying here. 
Um, but let's start at the beginning. Uh, immediately we see that Jesus is trying to draw a contrast here between the Old Testament manna, the bread that came from heaven, and this New Testament bread of life, which is Jesus himself who has come from heaven. And uh, what he's showing them is that the Old Testament stuff really points to the bread of life, right? It, it was only there to paint a picture of who he came to be. Uh, what Jesus is saying is that the Old Testament manna could not in itself produce life, right? It didn't give eternal life to eat the manna. Instead, it was a way that God provided for a physical need, but it didn't do anything for their spiritual need, uh, for, the, for their forgiveness of sin, which still remains. And so um, the, the point Jesus is making is, look, Israel ate that stuff for 40 years and they still died. It didn't save them. But whoever eats this bread is assured something better. They are assured eternal life. And so the crowd listens to this, and they're like, all right, um, I, I think we're tracking with you, Jesus. Uh, you're saying we need something better than manna if we're going to have this, this everlasting life that you're talking about. But um, you're telling us that you are the bread of life, and now you just said that we need to eat the bread of life. Uh, that sounds kind of weird. Can you explain? Can you clarify this a little bit for us? Um, that's that's kind of where the crowd is at. So in verse 51, Jesus said, this bread is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. Now, those of us who are reading this from the other side of the cross, as we are, we understand what Jesus is talking about, right? He's going to give his, his body, his flesh, as a sacrifice on the cross. And, and he's going to do that for the forgiveness of the sins of the world because he knows that his good and perfect sacrifice will be received by the Father as payment in full for our sin. And we understand that looking at it from the other side of the cross, but understand that all this crowd is hearing is that Jesus wants them to eat his flesh. That's gross, right? I mean, that's cannibalism. This can't be right. And so they're, they're starting to realize that he's probably using figurative language here, but what does he mean? What does he want us to do with this? They can't figure it out. In verses 53 to 57, uh, Jesus tries to explain, but it seems like at least on a surface level, he doesn't make things better. Uh, he actually makes them worse. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. So now he's gone from just eating the flesh, and he's adding that they need to drink his blood also. So if it wasn't gross enough, like it's getting worse, you can understand why this would be disturbing on many levels to the people who are hearing this. Like not only does it sound nasty, but the very word of God in the book of Leviticus says that it is forbidden for the people of God to drink blood of any kind, right? And so not only is Jesus asking them to do something strange and gross, but he's asking them to do something contrary to the word of God. This can't be the, the son of God who's asking us to do this, right? And so you can sort of understand why many people walked away at this point. It's a difficult teaching. We don't know what to do with this. And so they leave. How are we supposed to understand this? Well, let me ask you, how are we supposed to understand this? <laughs> what do we do with a passage like this? Well, maybe something that jumps out at us, and certainly we see many scholars point this out, um, that there could be a connection here to communion, which we celebrated last week as we came to the Lord's table and we, uh, we drank the cup and we ate the bread. Uh, maybe there's a connection here. Maybe this is what Jesus is talking about. Um, maybe he's looking ahead to the institution of communion and saying, this is how we eat his flesh. Not literally, right? But we eat this bread, which represents his body, and it's a reminder to us of what he did for us on the cross. And so maybe this is how we, we eat his flesh, right? Or, you know, as we drink his blood, we don't really drink his blood, right? I mean, <laughs> we, can't, we can't do that, but we drink this juice. And it's a reminder, it's a representation to us of his blood that was shed for our sins. And so maybe this is what uh, Jesus is really talking about here. Sounds good, right? But there's a problem with this. And it's probably not what Jesus is talking about here. And it's not just that, that, you know, Jesus didn't know about communion. He did. He's the one who instituted communion later. So I'm sure he knew that this was going to be a thing. But the problem with this whole analysis that this could be talking about communion is that Jesus attaches an unqualified promise to this. Do you see it there in the text? Whoever eats my flesh... And whoever drinks my blood has something. What is it? Eternal life. Does that sound right? 
If we're talking about communion, whoever takes communion has eternal life. Is that what Jesus is saying? Can't be, right? That's not the source of eternal life. The source of eternal life is Jesus himself. And so it can't just be whoever, you know, participates in this ritual has eternal life. That's not the idea. That's not what Jesus is saying. So the question is, what is he saying? (laughs) What does it mean? Well, it turns out that it's actually a lot less of a mystery than it appears at first glance. Uh, For a first century Jewish audience, there was a pretty clear metaphor that Jesus is using here. To, to eat something or to drink something. We find in other Jewish writings, you know, these kind of references. And what it really means uh, when it's being used metaphorically, when it's not being used literally, um, is that it means to take something in to your innermost being, to receive something in your heart, right? That's really what it means. And that's actually not such a strange concept for us because we use the same thing in English when you really think about it. How many of you have ever devoured a good book? Now, did you literally tear the pages out and swallow them? No, but you devoured a, a good book. You just, you, you flew through it because it was so good, right? How many of you have ever drank in a really good sermon, right? I mean, maybe you've had to uh, make a difficult decision in life and you decided to, to chew over the matter before you came to a final conclusion, right? You didn't literally, you know, bite the thing that you were trying to decide about. I mean, I can't be the only one. How many of you have ever eaten your words, Anybody? Yeah. So we use this metaphor. We understand what it means. It's, it's talking about something deeper than the, the level of the surface. It's not a physical thing. It's a, a spiritual thing. It's taking something in. It's, it's receiving something in your heart. And so what Jesus is really doing here is he's pointing back to verse 35. Remember I told you to remember that verse, that it comes back around at the end? Here's where it comes back around. How do we eat the flesh of Jesus? How do we drink the blood of Jesus? Well, I think verse 35 is the key to understanding this. Eat my flesh. He says, come to me and you will never go hungry, right? We need to come to him. We need to step away from the old life. We need to trust him alone. This is the very thing that will cause us to never be hungry and to receive eternal life. Drink my blood. He says, believe in me and you will never thirst, right? My, my blood is real drink. This is the thing that will cause you to have eternal life, and you'll never thirst again, right? And so what Jesus is really saying here is that if you come to me, and if you believe, if you take me into your innermost being and receive me in your heart, if you put your trust in the sacrifice that I am going to make for you, then you will truly be saved. Then you will truly be in me, and I will be in you, and I will keep you until the very end, and on the last day I will raise you to eternal life. That's the promise that Jesus is making here, and what a promise this is. I mean, can you think of anything greater? So as we bring this home, verse 58, Jesus tells us that he himself is the bread that has come down from heaven, and he says this bread is better than the manna that your ancestors received in the wilderness better than than any physical blessing that you could ever receive. He says, look, your ancestors ate that bread for 40 years and they still died grumbling. But whoever receives the bread of life in their innermost being will not perish, but they will be raised to eternal life. And Jesus says, this is actually what the feeding of the 5,000 was actually all about. It was never just about a, a miracle of multiplying bread to meet a physical need. The whole purpose of it was to be a sign, right? It wasn't just to point you back in your memory to remember, you know, Moses and the manna that your ancestors ate in the wilderness. No, a sign always points forward, right? Points to something that is up ahead. And Jesus says the sign is this. It's not about the manna in the wilderness. It's about the better manna that has come down from heaven to save your eternal soul to fill the void that is in your life, that hunger that you've tried to satisfy in so many different ways, it can finally be satisfied. And it is all in me. If you will come to me, and if you will believe, it will change everything in your life. So let's pray. Let's thank God for that truth. Let's ask ourselves, have we received the better manna that satisfies our souls? Have we trusted in the one who gives life? God, we thank you this morning for who you are, We thank you for what you have done. God, we thank you for your word, even when it's a little bit more difficult to understand, Father. 
we praise you that through your spirit that we can comprehend, we can understand that the greater truth. And Lord, I just pray this morning that all across this place that we would understand what it is that you're saying to us, that we would realize that we all have a hunger in our life. We're all thirsting for something. And many of us have tried many different things to, to feed that hunger, to satisfy that thirst. And apart from you, none of them work. And so, Jesus, I pray that anybody who's here this morning who has not received you in their heart as Lord and Savior of their life, Lord, that they might turn to you, that they might step away from the old life of hunger and that they might truly be satisfied in you. And Lord, for those of us who have already made that decision, God, I pray this morning that you would give us thankful hearts, that we would recognize that it's not because of the works that we have done, that there is only one work, which is to believe in the one that you sent. And God, because of Jesus, we have eternal life. And so God, we thank you. And I pray that that would impact every aspect of our lives, that as we live in this world, that people would see thankful hearts that are giving all the praise and all of the glory to you, for you alone deserve it. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
until he returns or calls me home, you know that he is preparing a new home for us, that we have something better at the end of all of this. That is the great promise. That is where our hope rests, not in this life being better or this world somehow reforming itself, but our hope rests in the fact that God is preparing a new home for us. And I think the only response that we can have to that is a grateful heart that is overflowing with thanks. I heard a story from a missionary one time when he went and for two weeks they built a new home for this family and there was a little girl there that he became very close with. And at the end of the the two weeks when the home was built, uh, this girl came and she gave him one of her only worldly possessions. It was a broken toy. It didn't even function any longer, but it was one of the only things that she had. And she put it in his hand to say, thank you for what you've done for me. And as he got on the bus and the bus began to drive away, he looked back and through the window of her new house in, in her new bedroom, he saw this little girl dancing for, for joy <laughs> over this new house that she had been given. And he said to me, you know, that was thanks enough. I didn't, I didn't need her toy, but just to see how thankful her heart was, I would have done it a hundred times over. And you know, I began to realize as I heard him tell that story that many times I'm that little girl and God has done so much for me and I want to pay him back somehow. And so I try to do more and I try to do more and I say, here God, here, take this. Let me thank you. And, and I realize that everything that I try to do is just a broken toy. It's not really what he wants. He has made me a new home where I will live for all of eternity. And as he looks into the window of my heart and yours, all he really wants to see is us dancing for joy because of what he's done. And so as we go, let's go with grateful hearts, overflowing with thanksgiving for what he has done for you and for me. And let's live that out as we walk through this world. Amen.